Okay, so we're going to start today by taking a look at a brand new table saw and I'll take you through the steps that we need to go through to set the machine up to work really accurately. Um, the same steps would apply if you have an older saw that has never been tuned before. Um, now the reason I'm using this new saw instead of my own is that a lot of the adjustments are very, very particular, such as adjusting the trunnions of the saw relative to the miter slot and setting up the splitter uh, in the correct position for safe ripping. Those kinds of adjustments, um, often I go to somebody else's shop to help them set up their saws and I tell them these adjustments are uh, basically for life. Once I make that adjustment, as long as nobody plays with it again, uh, it is pretty much set up and then you're free to build uh, various jigs and things. Well, on my table saw, if I were to start playing around with the trunnions just for the sake of uh, teaching you how to do these things, uh, then some of my jigs actually wouldn't work properly anymore. So that's why I was able to borrow another saw just to teach you these techniques. So I wanted to start by going through a list of the various steps uh, in, in tuning up a saw like this, and then I'll get into how to actually accomplish them. So the first thing, you'll see that every table saw has a few different parts. What we have here is a main, the main table and attached on either side we have extension wings. Sometimes the wing is uh, stamped steel or it could be sort of an open web uh, kind of cast iron. These are solid flat cast iron wings and we have one on the left, another one on the right here and then we have an extension table. Um, in this case this saw is set up right now with a 30 inch fence which is why the extension table is short, uh, but table saws often come with a 52 inch fence if you have the room for it and a much longer extension table as well. Now one of the theories I have in the, in the way I work is that I don't want the wings to ever be higher than the main table. You can imagine that if this wing were level, uh, angling upwards in this direction, then when I lay a board across the saw, it actually would be sitting on an angle off the saw table, which means when my blade is set 90 degrees to the table, I will not get a 90 degree cut vertically. And that's very important. So the first thing I like to do is get the wings to be as flush as I can make them to the saw, to the main table, but I also feel that no part of the wing should go uphill, only downhill. Obviously, if I could get them dead flush, and flat, that would be even better, but it's not always possible. Okay, so I'll just take a straight edge, place that across the saw in order to see whether the wing is um, too high on the tip here, in which case you would see this kind of thing, or if it were too low, you'd see a big gap down here on the corner. But I also want to make sure that the wing isn't higher than the table. So if I take a straight object like this ruler here and slide it across and you hear that sound, that's because the corner of the ruler is hitting the wing. It's a little bit high right there. Okay, I'm just doing that so that you can actually hear it, but of course I can feel it with my finger. The wing's too high right there in the corner. Down here, the table's actually too high. It makes a noise when I go that way. When I go the other way, it won't because that is the lower object. So right now this wing is set up too high on that end, but then it becomes too low on this end. So that needs to be adjusted. So number one, the first step is that I'd like the extension wings uh, and extension table Uh, to be flush to the main table. And if it isn't quite possible to get these two uh, things to be also level to the main table, then I want them angled downward. relative to the main table. You'll see later on when I show actual techniques for cross-cutting that if my extension wing on the right 
and the extension table go slightly downhill, I can still support a board underneath it with a very thin piece of wood while doing a cross cut in the, in the right miter slot. But if it were to go uphill, there's nothing I can do to compensate for that. My board would be on this angle while I'm cutting and I wouldn't get a 90 degree cut. Okay, the second step is very similar to that one. I need to make the table insert, which is this red object here in the middle that fills the hole. I need to also get that flush to the table all around. So the table insert must be flush or below the main table at all times. Then the next step, we have a couple of other uh, steps here. Number three, we need to adjust the trunnions of the saw in order to get the blade either parallel to the miter slot or slightly off parallel. I'm going to explain a little later why I actually set a table saw up with the blade slightly non-parallel to the right miter slot on purpose. So I'll just put that down as uh, adjusting the trunnion to miter slot adjusting the trunnion to the miter slot positioning and fourthly of course we also need to adjust our fence in order to get it parallel to the miter slot for those rip cuts so I'll say making fence parallel to the miter slot or I can say miter slots. The miter slots of course are supposed to be parallel to each other from the manufacturer. Now another step to worry about as well, a table saw blade doesn't just go up and down but of course it also adjusts either left or right depending on whether you bought a left tilt table saw or a right tilt. Okay, so we have another dial that we turn to move the blade over for a beveled cut. And this will tilt down to 45 degrees right. So this is a right tilt table saw. Okay, right meaning from where I'm standing as the operator. Um, I'll, I'll discuss that in a minute, the difference between a left tilt table saw and a right tilt. Um, <clears throat> but we do have stops underneath the saw, I'll have to show you a little later, that determine how far right I can tilt the blade and how far back towards vertical I can go. So by setting those stops, that determines my 90 degree and 45 degree positioning. Now another step beyond that has to do with the miter gauge itself. So here we have a miter gauge that slides in the left miter slot or the right and we can't have too much slop between the two. In other words, if the miter gauge is too small, if the bar is too narrow relative to the sl uh, slot, do you hear that uh, free play there? What that means is the bar is smaller than the slot, so there is some room for it to sort of wobble back and forth as I'm cutting. And that means that when I push forward, this will shift one way. When I go backwards, it will shift the other way. And that's a way that you would lose accuracy on your cross cuts. So there are different ways to make miter slots. Uh, expand to take up the space in the slot. Some miter gauges come with built-in uh, mechanisms to widen the bar to fit the slot better. Other miter gauges don't and just have a straight bar. 
and I'll cover that a little later what I do to actually make the bar a little bit wider. So let me just add those last couple of steps to our list here. One of them is to um, set our stops, set the stops for 90 degree and 45 degree positioning of the blade as it bevels. And number six, to remove miter gauge slop. So that the, the runner of the miter gauge isn't able to play freely left and right in the miter slot. The last step I'm going to write here is splitter alignment. And when I cover that a little bit later in, in greater detail, I'll cover all of the different components of a, a blade guard, but there are many different parts to it. The piece of steel back here, which attaches to the saw brackets, is what we call the splitter, and it has a very particular positioning required in order to improve safety when ripping lumber. So we need to go into that in great detail. I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about this left tilt versus right tilt issue. This is a right tilt saw, so it tilts to my right. That's compared to the, where the operator is standing. And the left tilt, of course, tilts that way. I happen to believe that a right tilt saw is the correct saw for a right-handed person. And let me explain why. First of all, if you're right-handed, you definitely rip lumber with the fence on the right side of the blade. If you were left-handed, the fence should actually be on the left side of the blade, and you should do everything with opposite hands that a right-hander would do. But when I ask a left-hander, do you actually do that? They usually say, no, no, uh, I was taught that the fence goes on the right, so that's how I do it. And that's usually how it goes. Uh, left-handed people are kind of forced to adapt to a right-handed world, and they just adapt to it. So, let me explain a little bit about how the saw is made. On the right side of the blade here, we have something called the arbor flange. Well, that's a fixed object, and then the blade slides over the arbor up against the flange. That means on a right tilt saw, if I change from thick blade to thin blade, the right side of the blade is still always in the same place because a right tilt saw has the arbor flange on the right side. Now a left tilt saw has the arbor flange or has the arbor coming from the left side and the arbor flange over here. So if you were to put a thicker blade on, the right side of the blade would be further towards the right. And with a thinner blade, the right side of the blade of course is further to the left. Now that means with a left tilt saw, every time you change blade thicknesses, the tape reading on your fence can't possibly be right for both. Okay, with a right tilt saw, no matter how many times I change blade thicknesses or even put a dado set on, the right side of that blade setup is always the same and the tape reads correctly. Secondly, I'm going to show you later how important it is for the right side of the splitter which is, again, the piece of metal here on the uh, blade guard assembly. When that's sitting in there, it is critical that the right side of the splitter be aligned to the right side of the cut line. I'll explain what I mean by that later, but the reason for that is that the right side of the splitter helps to hold the wood tight to the fence while cutting. Well, with a left tilt saw, every time you change blade thicknesses, either the, you know, the right side of the blade changes position. So at some times, your wood would not be touching this. There would be a gap between the wood and the splitter. With other blade thicknesses, you could actually hit the splitter and not be able to get through during the cut. And that's probably one of the biggest reasons people say uh, blade guards are a piece of junk. It's always in my way. It never seems to work right. And they just rip it off and throw it away. And I'm going to explain later why I think the blade guard is your number one uh, tool to keep you safe on a table saw 
particularly when ripping. Okay, so personally, I'm a major, uh, I, I really recommend right tilt saw for right-handed people as well as for left-handed people who work like a right-hander. And if you say to me, well, I already have a left tilt saw, or when I went to buy my saw, uh, the salesperson told me to buy a left tilt saw, and that's what I bought. I would say, don't worry about it. It's not the end of the world. But what it means is, you should use the exact same blade thicknesses for ripping. In other words, I don't want to see you ripping one minute with a thin kerf rip blade, and then an hour later you put on a full kerf combination blade because that splitter can't possibly be aligned perfectly for both. Okay, so you're going to want to be more careful about which blades you buy and the specific kerf sizes of those blades in order to have more safety uh, in use. Now the main reason people argue that you need a left tilt saw is that if I'm going to angle the blade like this and put my fence on the right side and do a rip cut, it's a little more dangerous because the piece of wood is trapped under an angled blade. And the off cut on the other side sort of is released on top of a spinning blade. My answer to that is, let's put the fence over on the left side for beveled rip cuts. And I'll show you how to do that later. It's not that difficult. That means, in other words, I kind of have to work in a more awkward way for that one cut. But what I can't understand is, I only do a beveled rip cut on a fairly rare occasion. And yet, the problems caused by having a left tilt saw are things like, not having the splitter be as safe for ripping, for normal everyday ripping, and losing the accuracy of my fence tape every single time I change blade thicknesses. So by going the left tilt route, it makes me a little bit safer for a cut I only do once in a blue moon, whereas I, I have these com, uh, constant daily annoyances with other uh, safety and accuracy issues every time I switch blade thicknesses. It doesn't make sense to me. Personally, if you don't have a saw yet, I would say right tilt saw if you're right-handed or a left-hander work, working on the right, move the fence to the left for those beveled rip cuts. So you remember that the wing right here is higher than the table. That's why you can hear it when my ruler bumps into it in that direction. Whereas in this direction, there's no sound because this is lower and I'm not actually bumping into it. It's very important that this wing is level to the main table or below it everywhere. So let's say you have an old saw at home and you get this end level and the other end and in the middle this is high. That, that either means that the wing is convex like this or that the table is concave or both. Well I have to have the wing flush or lower everywhere. So I may have to lower the wing extra so that it touches, you know, maybe flush on both ends but low in the middle or maybe flush in the middle but low on both ends. Whatever you have to do to make sure it never sticks up. Okay, on this one I can feel that the wing is higher here but the wing is actually lower here. So I need to start to loosen the bolts that hold the wing onto the main table. Okay, so on this saw, we can see that there are three hex head bolts here. Some, uh, sometimes you'll find a, sort of a hex shaped um, bolt head instead of a cap screw like this. And we just need to loosen those. If I loosen them a lot, the whole wing could just suddenly drop quite a bit. And I don't want it to drop too easily. So I'm just going to loosen them all slightly. And then I like to use a rubber mallet in order to knock it into place, feeling along the top to see when I've gotten it flush. So if I feel along the table now, right here it was a little bit too high. I'm just going to tap that wing down a little bit. <laughs> 
on this end, I need to tap it up a little bit. Basically using my finger on the top to feel when it's flush. Once you think you have one end okay, then go ahead and tighten that bolt a little bit more. And you can leave the other two a little loose so you can sort of seesaw on the other one. Now if you have a bolt here holding the rear fence rail on, that may be something that's also keeping the wing from moving up and down. There should be some play in that that will allow me to move a little bit. Now I should be able to move. Oh yeah, that went down all the way too far now. You see, when I go like this now, you now hit the other way, which means it's now too low. So I'm just going to hit it with a mallet from underneath. And you see how I can control it because I haven't loosened the bolts underneath too much, so it's not too free. Now I would say it's just barely below the table now, almost flush. So it's time to tighten up those bolts before I lose that setup. Once they're tight, these aren't things that change easily. You'd have to put extremely heavy lumber on your saw kind of in a very rough way to get these things to move again. So as long as you tighten them up well, and you don't drop your table saw off a pickup truck anytime soon. It should be okay for a long time. You can see on my saw, I had to shim underneath with a couple of wooden wedges. Okay, these are actually wedge shaped. And um, I just left them sticking out so you could see them. You could have other ones tucked in here and then cut off flush if you, if you care. It doesn't matter if it sticks out. But it's very important to remember to put the shim material as close to the bolt as you can get in. Because if you put the shim way over here, halfway between the bolts, then when you tighten the bolts really tight, you're actually bending the casting. And cast iron is actually very brittle. It isn't very hard to break. So get the shim material in here. And that's allowing me to lift the front edge of the wing upwards so that it didn't sag down on the tip here. When you're finished dealing with the left wing, don't forget that you do have another wing on the other side. So we've got the right wing, we also have the extension table, and the extension table would be far longer if we had a 52 inch fence on this saw. Again, we want this flush to this, or lower, but never higher. And of course I would like the tip to be at the same level as this table if I could, but if I can't, downhill is always better get this flush to this, but also downhill. Okay, in other words, every cross cut I do, as long as I'm holding the wood down tightly to the main table, I know that the extension wing and the extension table can't ever hold my board up on a funny angle during the cut. So the next step here, where we need to get the table insert uh, in the saw and get it level. Again, when I'm coming across the saw with a board, I want it touching the main table tightly. I can't have this higher than the main table anywhere. And these kinds of parts on table saws, you know, they're not uh, highly machined like a cast iron table. So it's possible it might even be slightly convex, which would mean that both of these sides may have to be slightly below the cast iron in order for the top not to be higher. Okay, we take a hex key, and that there's a little adjustable uh, set screw in each corner. By turning clockwise, that set screw is pushing down on the little metal ledges that you see underneath here. There's four of them. So that's how we raise and lower the insert. Of course, once you set it up once, it is set up pretty much for the life of the saw, except every time you change your blade, you should double check that you don't have piles of sawdust sitting on these little ledges, which of course raises the insert higher off the table. Now, when I just turned that to raise it, 
my ruler is catching it now. So it's too high now. So I'll just back that down. You hear that sound every time I hit the red insert. That means I'm hitting it. So I'm going to go down even a bit more. Just give it a push to make sure it went down. Now there's no sound when I get there. That means that I'm either flush or below. And I'm just feeling with my finger as well. I have to check that on all four corners. There it's hitting the red. That's better. Try the other side. I'm hitting the red insert. Back it off, push it down. Oops. Much better. Same here. Now here I don't hear any sound, so maybe it's too low. So I'll, I'll turn it until it does hit. Okay, there. And then back up a little at a time until the sound is gone. Basically, when you go around the entire insert like this, I don't want to hear that ruler catching on the insert anywhere around its perimeter. And after you've checked that, also go across the whole table. Do you see how I can rock that ruler? That means that insert is higher somewhere in the middle. Well, now I'm forced to lower both of these so the whole insert goes down until the ruler can sit on both sides of the table tight without this interfering. So it's actually slightly convex across the width. A little bit less there, and it's still the same thing there. Okay, so you understand that if I have a piece of wood across here, maybe you're, you've got it in the right miter slot and you're cross cutting, that piece of wood could be sitting tight on the cast iron until I get to the insert and suddenly the insert, because it's higher in the middle, is lifting me up on this angle and of course the angle of cut has to change. So I can't get a perfect cross cut. Okay, so th these little things actually matter. And that's why sometimes people make their own zero clearance inserts. I'll talk about those a little more later, but they make them out of very rough um, scrap plywood they have kicking around their shop. And I'd rather have something a little bit nicer, either metal or um, some of the commercially made zero clearance inserts are incredibly flat, better than the metal ones even. Okay, so that's something to watch out for for accuracy. The next thing we need to look at are the stops inside the saw that limit us to a 45 degree bevel and a 90 degree uh, blade setup. So I'd like to take you inside the, sh the saw and just show you what one of those stops looks like. Now if you look right down inside the saw you'll see a silver bolt right there and that's our 45 degree limiting stop. When the trunnions are adjusted with the dial it goes this way for 45 degrees, this way for 90. So when I go this way, as far as I can go, that bolt is traveling up this way and finally hits a casting on the bottom of the tabletop here. So by adjusting that bolt clockwise, it goes into the trunnion and allows me to angle more. By backing it out, it stops me earlier. So that's what we need to adjust to get the saw to go to 45 degrees. On the other side of the trunnion, you have to go way underneath the saw to see that. We have another similar bolt that hits another casting and that uh, determines when we're at 90 degrees. So these are things you have to adjust on a new saw or maybe an old one that has never been set up before. When I turn this dial as far as I can go to get to 90 degrees, if I discover that that's actually beyond 90 degrees, but let's say in this position it's 90 degrees. Then I will, I will go back and make sure I'm going only one direction so I've removed any free play in the threads. That's what we call backlash. And if that position right there cuts exactly 90 degrees, I will draw a pencil line right on the cabinet of my saw here to show me that when this handle is on that line, I'm extremely close to 90 degrees. So as long as I dial it up to that line, I'm probably within a half degree or better. That might be okay for a certain cut you're doing, like a rip cut. 
because you may be going to joint and plane the board as well. So you may not have to get it perfect. But that will get me very, very close. And then if it's really important, then I'll also um, do an actual test cut to confirm it's exactly 90 degrees before I commit to it. But that alone saves me a lot of time. And of course, I may have another line elsewhere on the, on the dial showing me where the 45 degree stop is. Now, one of the things I recommend when you're setting those stops underneath, I don't actually like setting them to get me to exactly 90 degrees and exactly 45. Because unless your dust collection on your table saw is extremely efficient, usually there's a bit of sawdust that piles up right on the head of that bolt, which is the stop, or on the casting that the bolt touches. And that sawdust alone will prevent you from getting to 80, uh, 90 degrees or to 45. It'll stop you a bit early. So what I prefer is to adjust that stop such that I can get even beyond 90 degrees. You see, this is a right tilt saw, and yet if I keep dialing, I can actually go to the point I'm tilting left a little bit. That means even if there's some sawdust on the stop, I'm still likely to be able to get to 90 degrees. Okay, and I would also adjust the other stop such that I can come down to about 46 or 47 degrees instead of just 45. That way I can always get where I need to. And once I confirm exactly where the position of the dial is that gives me 45 and 90, I'll then draw with a pencil line on the side of the cabinet to show me where to put that dial in future. In other words, I'm not really counting on the stops. I'm setting them to allow me to go beyond where I need to get later. One of the things people may not know there's a big difference between setting the blade 90 degrees to the table when it's stationary versus having that blade actually cut at 90 degrees while operating. What I found is that usually the blade cuts at 90 degrees when there's a slight gap between the blade and my square at the bottom. Whereas most people, of course, would try to dial it in to the point that the square touches tightly with no gap anywhere. That seems to make more sense. But let me explain uh, with a, a little drawing why this often happens. So what you might not realize is that a lot of table saw blades are actually hollow in the center on both sides. So let's say this is your table saw top right here, which of course is higher than the center point of the blade where the arbor is going to be. Um, when you put a square on the blade in order to see if, if it's actually positioned square to the table, we, we actually want the blade, or we want the, the table to be square to the tangent point of the blade, sort of out to the perimeter where the teeth are. So this sort of explains why often you actually need a bit of a gap between the bottom of the square and the blade in order for it to cut square. Once again, instead of testing the blade with a square while it's stationary to determine whether it's actually set 90 degrees to the table, what would be better is to actually cut a piece of wood and then test the cut after it's complete because we want to measure uh, the result while the blade is moving, while it's actually working, as opposed to while stationary. It does two different things. Okay, and when you do that test, you don't want to cut a board that's only this thin. You want a board that is maybe two and a half to three inches thick because it's a much better test for squareness on an object that is much taller. You'll see the error a lot easier. So let's just take a quick look here at our list. I showed you how to uh, double check that the wings and extension table are flush to the main table. Um, we made sure that the table insert is flush or below the main table everywhere. And we also looked at setting the stops for 90 and 45 degrees. Again, I prefer setting it so we can actually go beyond 90, like 91 degrees, and beyond 45 to 46 or 47 and then put a mark on the cabinet of the saw to show where the dial should be 
to get those exact numbers. And of course, you can't actually uh, determine that without a real test cut with the saw running. Okay, so now we'll move on and look at some of these other issues like adjusting the trunnion, trunnions, adjusting the fence, getting rid of miter gauge slop, and splitter alignment, which is really crucial. So the next step we want to look at is adjusting the uh, blade parallelism relative to the miter slot. Now a lot of people will tell you that the table saw blade has to be exactly parallel to the miter slot. And I actually disagree with that. First of all, when you try to adjust the trunnions of a saw, or in the case of a full cabinet saw like this one, you actually turn the tabletop relative to the base, not the actual guts of the saw. I think it's pretty much impossible to set anything within zero thou of something else. And I know that if you adjust that blade such that it angles this way, even one or two one thousandths of an inch, well, you're always ripping with the fence on the right side again, remember, if you're right-handed or left-handed working in a right-handed world. As that board comes through, it gets cut by the front teeth first. And as the board hits the rear teeth, I don't want those teeth cutting it again. Because sometimes you, you only want to push a board. I'll show you the technique later. I wouldn't be doing it the way I'm holding this right now. But sometimes you don't want to push the board all the way past the entire blade because it's already sticking way out on a roller stand. Well, if my blade were angled slightly that way, the rear teeth would have just recut that wood all the way up to the point where I stopped, but not the front part. That means the edge can't be on the same plane all the way along it. It's going to have two different planes like this. Okay, so I prefer to adjust the blade three to five one thousandths of an inch this way, non-parallel to the miter slot, so that the rear teeth don't interfere with the cut at all. Now you'll get rid of problems like the rear teeth burning the wood or ruining the cut. Okay, now you might say, well, why don't we just adjust the fence like this, non-parallel to, the, to the, the blade or the miter slot? That can be done. But I prefer to set the fence parallel to the miter slot and then do my cross cuts on the right side of the blade and get perfect cross cuts at the same time, okay, by angling the blade this way. So remember, I want the front teeth to be closer to the miter slot than the back. The back is just a tiny bit wider like this. Now most often you'll see uh, woodworking articles or even the manuals of different table saws showing the miter, uh, miter gauge in the left slot. The reason I always find this a bit uh, strange is that we always have a wing on the left side of the saw, but that's it, nothing else. Okay, if you have a sliding table, that's a whole other story. Now you are going to be cross-cutting with the wood on the left. But most people do have not just a right wing, but also some kind of extension table on the right. In this case, I have a very small extension table because I have a 30-inch fence on this saw. But on my saw, I have a 52-inch fence and a very large extension table. So why would I cross-cut long boards on the left side of the blade where I only have this much table to support it and the board's going to hang way out in mid-air needing some kind of table or support stand when I could be using the extension wing and extension table to hold my boards for cross-cutting as well. Okay, most people will, t will say to you, Extension tables are only for ripping, you know, when you're ripping a full sheet of plywood, 48 inches wide. But I don't see why we shouldn't use it to support longer boards when cross-cutting as well. So what I like to do, again, set the fence parallel to the miter slot, but set the blade angled three to five one thousandths of an inch this way. And now, all my rips, of course, happen on the right side because I'm right-handed and I never hit the rear teeth. 
and by putting the miter gauge in the right slot for all cross cuts, I also never hit the rear teeth during a cross cut. So that gives me perfect cross cuts, no burning, and no extra cutting by the rear teeth. Now for someone who does have a sliding table already or they just want to have one, then we need a slightly different approach. If you tell me that you're definitely going to cross cut on the left slot, then I actually want you to adjust the blade three to five thou this way relative to this slot for your cross cuts to come out perfect. Well then you're going to have to adjust your fence to be three to five thou more this way relative to the blade in order to have perfect rip cuts as well. But that's why I prefer to just do my rips and cross cuts both on the right side and adjust this way. Now let me just explain briefly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about shifting the trunnions. When you buy what's called a contractor saw, and they're getting a little less common these days, but it's the kind of saw where you have a motor hanging out the back of the saw on a belt. On those saws, the trunnions, which is essentially the cast iron guts of the saw, actually hang from the bottom of the tabletop. So if you want to adjust the blade like this, you have to loosen the bolts that hold the trunnions to the tabletop themselves uh, underneath the saw and then move the guts of the saw like this. When you get into full-size cabinet saws like this three horsepower saw, the trunnions are actually bolted to the cabinet itself and the top is simply bolted down to the cabinet. The trunnions aren't attached to the top at all. So that makes the adjustment of the blade to miter slot parallelism a lot easier. I just have to loosen four bolts I'll show you a bit later that hold the top down onto the cabinet and turn the tabletop instead of turning the blade. Now let me just show you in order to even measure what's going on in terms of whether the blade right now is angled this way or this way because you never know when you buy a new saw or buy an old saw which way it is. I have to test for it. First thing I need to do is get rid of this kind of slop between the bar and the table. Okay, now if you look here, this particular uh, model has a couple of adjustable um, pieces that can be adjusted to come out of the bar to take up the slop. Okay, and there are a couple of bolts here you adjust, another one on the other side to move it in and out. So that's how you adjust that. If you have a different kind of miter gauge, like this one for my Delta Unisaw, it doesn't have anything like that. Um, you'll read about how people take a, uh, a punch, like a center punch, and punch the metal on the sides, which of course folds the metal outward around where you punched it in, and that makes the metal kind of bulge out uh, to take up the slack and you have to do it in many many places along the bar. Then the article usually says, if it's an article, um, some of them will be too tight now so then you get a file and file them down uh, so that it isn't too hard to get in. I personally don't like that approach. I find it so hit and miss, literally, <laughs> and it, uh, it just leaves something to be desired. I'll show you what I do. I have multiple rolls of what we call ultra high molecular weight plastic tape. Okay, I can buy a certain thickness at Lee Valley, one of our suppliers here in Canada. Of course, every Canadian woodworker knows Lee Valley. And that, uh, the one they currently sell is uh, seven one thousandths of an inch thick. But if you look around, you may be able to find other suppliers of the tape in lots of thicknesses. So here I have it marked inside, 0 0.005 inches. I have 0 0.010, so 10 thou, 20 thou, and 7 thou. Okay, when you get a new table saw, sometimes the bar is just a tiny bit sloppy in the miter slot, but not that much. I'll just live with it for a few months. But believe it or not, you actually wear the steel bar and the cast iron in the slot over time. And maybe six months later or so, there will be enough slop 
to get maybe a five thou or three thou, if you can get it, piece of this special tape on there. It's a very re uh, resilient plastic tape that lasts a long time, very hard and very slippery. So I will just cut that tape the correct width or slightly less to fit on the side of the bar and just tape it on. And what I like about it is I'm taking up the slop in the bar or on the bar, uh, in the slot equally along the entire length rather than sort of um, punching the metal maybe unequally as I go along. Okay, so some of you that have this type of bar with no adjustment, that method works beautifully and one piece of tape often lasts a full year or more if you take care of it. Um, and some of you that have the type that do have adjustments, sometimes I even then prefer to just put a piece of tape on the other side of the bar. It's up to you. Uh, these do work, but um, there are lots of different miter gauges out there and some are a little bit better than others. Okay, another thing to watch out for. We have this little um, sort of washer here that fits into the T slot of the table saw. And that is designed so that if you pull the miter gauge forward off the saw like this and let go, it doesn't fall on the floor. But it's much harder to get a miter gauge in by putting it in from the front like this because it, it takes a little bit of trial and error to get it to fit. If you get in the habit of always dropping it in from the back, and coming in backwards and taking your miter gauge out that way, then you don't get hung up and that means you're not going to damage the tape here trying to get into your saw every day. Before I can adjust the blade relative to the slot, I'd like to know what position it's in right now from the factory. Is it angled this way or that way? If you ask the manufacturers of table saws, what is your goal? They will say, well, our goal is to make it parallel to the miter slot. But of course, things like one or two or three one thousandths of an inch are so small that there's likely to be some error in either direction. We don't really know. Now, I can actually measure it with feeler gauges. But before I do that, let's just do a test. I just plugged in the saw. Of course, the saw wasn't plugged in before when I'm doing all these uh, different checks on a new saw and grabbing the blade with my hand and things like that. But I just plugged it in and I'm going to clamp this piece of wood to the miter gauge now. Make sure you've already removed all the slop from that uh, between the bar and the miter slot before you do this. I've got the blade raised to full height. And what I'm trying to do now is make a cut past the front teeth first and of course, then there's no, uh, there are no teeth. I'm, I'm going through the, the open area below the teeth, but then I'm going to carefully go past the rear teeth. And just by sound, we should be able to hear whether the rear teeth are cutting it a second time or not. Okay, I'm also going to stop right about here when the rear teeth are in the middle of the board and shut the saw off, just to show you something else that uh, I need to explain. So listen to the cutting action at the front and whether there is any cutting action at the back. Okay, listen to this. There's no question those rear teeth were cutting. You could hear it cutting. I can certainly hear it at the shutdown. I can smell the burn too. You can smell those teeth burning the wood. Let's take a close look at what actually happened here. This was the front of the board and this is the back. The front teeth of the blade cut all the way along and cut the whole thing beautifully. But then when I reached the rear teeth, the rear teeth started to recut the back of the board. Now there's also even a chance if my um, if the board wasn't clamped to the miter gauge of the board being thrown up off the table because the rear teeth of course are coming upwards out of the table. The front teeth go downwards and that holds the board down onto the table. Well then I stopped in the middle and because I sat there for a while the wood started to burn 
and then I turn the saw off and the, the teeth actually cut even deeper at the shutdown. Okay, so when I feel this, I can feel that this wood is higher, or in other words, sticking out further than the one part where I stopped. And this part here is actually higher still because the rear teeth cut more off than the front teeth, but I cut the most off during shutdown. You can actually see right through the part where the table saw rear teeth burned. And so if every cross cut you ever do on your table saw looks like this, your blade is definitely angled the wrong way relative to the miter slot you're using. Now, sometimes people ask me, I understand why you angle the blade this way a little so that the rear teeth don't recut the wood as you pass by it or as you pass by them. But why three to five thou? Why don't we just angle the blade this way by one thou? Okay, and that's what I was trying to prove by doing this cut here. What I've discovered is that when you shut a table saw off or start it up, the blade develops extra run out during the slowing down or speeding up phase. In other words, a blade seems to straighten out under the centrifugal forces of spinning. Well, this is what I call shutdown run out, or you could call it startup run out, depending which one you're doing at the time. But let's say I'm cross cutting something like this. I'm going to show you how to cross cut something wider in a cross cut sled later. Uh, let's say it's even twice as wide as this. I'm going to cut like this. And at some point, I may not want to go past the entire blade because this is so wide it's going to fall off my saw if I go too far. So I'm going to have to actually turn the saw off with my wood next to those rear teeth. I've discovered I need to be a minimum of three thou that way to make sure that even shutdown run out doesn't leave a mark. And up to five thou, even six, is also acceptable. So essentially my blade is angled this way and only the front right corner of the front teeth create the final cross cut or rip on my wood. The rear teeth don't do any cutting at all except to possibly burn the off cut, which of course is the waist side. So I don't really care about it. So that's why I suggest a minimum of three thou, a maximum of five or six. If you angle this way 20 thou, you're going to see some loss of smoothness in the cut. So we don't want to go too far either. Okay, so just out of interest, what I'm going to do now is shift this miter gauge over to go into the left side. You've seen the cut that I got on the right side. I'm going to cut the other end of the board now on the left side. So of course I have to switch this whole miter gauge face over, over to the left, otherwise I'm going to cut right through it with the blade. It's amazing how many people I've met who've actually done that. <laughs> Luckily they're made of aluminum, but it's still a pretty nasty mistake. So what I'd like you to do when you go home is to put a miter gauge on the right side, do a test cut, put a miter gauge on the left side, and do another test cut. Whichever side burns tells you which way your, the blade is positioned right now. Okay, here was the cut I did before. I'm going to cut the other end now. Slide this in on the left side. Clamp it in again. Don't forget your safety glasses. I mentioned before that my regular prescription glasses are safety lenses, but if there's no guard on during a test like this, you do need side shields as well. Okay, so when I make the cut, listen as I go past the right, or sorry, the rear teeth for whether uh, you hear it cut again or not. Cut it off. Okay, absolutely no cutting action 
at the rear, even during the shutdown runout. You see we have a beautiful cut, no burning, and no shutdown runout burn in the center. However, this requires me to do all my cross cuts on the left, and all my rips will be burned from now on. I need to change the rotation of the tabletop relative to the, uh, to the blade so that the blade ends up this way and I get perfect cross cuts on the right as well as rips from now on. Now if you have a contractor type saw, once again you have to actually adjust the trunnions under the table. I don't have a saw like that here so let me just explain briefly kind of what it looks like. At the back of the saw, let's say this is the back, and at the front of the saw, you have this sort of curved U-shaped piece of cast iron. And the trunnions of the saw, that is all of the cast iron that holds the blade, swivels like this whenever you change the, the bevel angle from 45 degrees to 90. Well right in here, if you look under the saw, there's usually two bolts. And I've even seen some models that had a third one in the center. Of course I found that out the hard way because I couldn't move it after loosening the two bolts I normally see. And you have to loosen these bolts and then grab the casting and start turning. Okay, so most, most of the ones I've seen have just two bolts. I don't want to loosen all four bolts fully because then the trunnions of the SAR basically could just move around freely. What I want to do is maybe uh, loosen this one, this one, and this one fully. Loosen that one just barely, just a tiny bit, so that when I start trying to move the guts of the saw, I'm actually pivoting on one bolt that is just loose. Okay, because these movements are supposed to be just a few one thousandths of an inch. I don't want the whole thing just moving around totally freely. The other thing to watch out for is that after making that adjustment, it is possible if you moved around too much like this that the blade might be so far off center to the insert that when you adjust the blade to 45 degrees the blade's actually hitting the insert. Okay, so when you adjust these trunnion bolts you have to be careful not to completely change the fact that the blade's supposed to be roughly in the middle of the insert. When you're done, angle the saw to 45 degrees and double check that there's no way those teeth can hit the insert, even during startup or shutdown runout. Now this saw, being a three horsepower full cabinet saw, like I said, it's a matter of loosening four bolts under the saw top that simply hold the top to the cabinet, and we just have to turn the top relative to the blade. The only thing that makes that easier to adjust than this type of contractor saw setup is that these bolts are hard to see. You're basically down on the floor on your knees with a flashlight trying to find them, whereas here the bolts are on the outside of the saw and it's far easier. So why don't we go under the saw and take a look at where those bolts are and start loosening them up. Now before we start adjusting the trunnions on, on the uh, Steel City saw there, we have to remember to unplug before we start handling the blade with our hands and things like that. I thought I should just talk about this for a second. You'll notice that my table saw has the outlet for it right here on the side. And here's the plug. So that's how I plug my saw in or unplug it. I get the feeling that if the outlet for your saw is 20 feet across the room, then all the times that you should be unplugging it, you'll be too lazy to do it. I really think it's important to have the outlet right there, so handy that you almost can't forget. So unplug the saw before you start handling it. Another story I tell people is that you often think, how could the saw possibly start up if you don't hit the on button, even though it is plugged in? Well, I actually had my table saw one time, actually not this table saw, a previous one, turn on by itself. And luckily I was on the other side of the room when it happened. It turned out there was enough sawdust in the switch to short it out. And from that point on, I will no longer touch a saw blade with my hand with it plugged in. I'll just unplug it, or sometimes if I just barely want to move the blade, I'll use something like a, a pencil or something, but not my own hand. Okay, so here's one of our bolts that holds 
the tabletop to the cabinet. And I'm just going to see if I can loosen that off. Okay. I want that to be reasonably loose. You don't have to go incredibly loose, but pretty loose. Then here's another one on this corner. There's one on every corner. Okay. Give it a couple of half turns. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to barely loosen because that's the one I I'm going to pivot on when I try to turn the table. But the fourth one way over in the other front right corner I'm going to loosen fully like the two at the back. This one just a tiny bit so that the whole table doesn't shift it a whole bunch laterally. Okay, I've readjusted the miter gauge face here again to be on the right side because that's where I need to measure this. And I'm going to measure the adjustment of the trunnion or the blade distance relative to the miter slot with some very simple tools. I've actually seen digital readout tools that cost hundreds of dollars designed to do things like that and I've never found a need to need uh, that sort of thing. What I'm going to do, first of all, I've got a uh, edge guide for my Bosch router, one of my Bosch routers, and I've just taken the steel rod out of that. I'm going to borrow that as a tool to clamp to the miter gauge face. And then I'm going to use some feeler gauges to measure the distance between the end of that bar and one of the front teeth, then slide the miter gauge back to measure the gap at the back. Now it's very important that I rotate the blade, remember it is unplugged, but I have to take the measurement using the exact same tooth both times by rotating. If I don't do that, I would be measuring the run out of the blade and the run out of the arbor itself. By using the same tooth, I eliminate that from the measurement. Okay, so I'll just start. First of all, make sure your blade is at full height because when I said I wanted a three to five thou difference this way, I'm talking at full height. If the blade were a lot lower, the difference now may only be two to three thou instead of three to five. I'm gonna put it back up and clamp this bar onto the face of the miter gauge. This miter gauge has grooves on the face, so it's kind of handy for trapping that metal bar in between the grooves. If you have a miter gauge that doesn't even come with a bar like that at all, you do need to put a wooden facing on it. And I'm going to use two clamps to hold that on firmly. Now the blade that I have on here, it's an alternating tooth bevel. That means one tooth points right and the next one left. And since I'm measuring on the right side of the blade, I want to pick a right pointing tooth for the measurement. Now if you take a look over on this side, I'm going to put a pencil mark right on the blade here so that I know that this is the tooth that I'm going to take the measurement from, regardless of whether I'm at the front or the back. Okay, make sure that you choose a right pointing tooth, whether it's an alternating tooth bevel blade, or sometimes what we call an ATBR, which is alternating tooth bevel and raker tooth. A raker tooth is straight. And position that tooth now, right around the position where it will be at the middle of this circle on the end of the steel rod. You could also use a piece of wooden dowel rod. Now the gap between the two is quite large at the moment. I don't want to be that large. I want to be really close. So I'm going to just tap that bar over using a hammer. Even though it's clamped, I can move it quite easily with a very light tap. What I used to do was to bring that bar up to touch the tooth and then try to get a three to five thou gap at the back. But what I discovered was even touching the tooth, I could flex the blade by one or two thou already and not even know it. So I prefer to have some sort of a gap. And then if this gap measures three thou, 
I want the back to be a minimum of six and a maximum of about eight, even nine. I'm going to go a little closer. Of course, if you hear a big bang, you've hit the blade, right? Okay, that's really close now. And now I look at my feeler gauges. I've got these really long feeler gauges from Lee Valley. I haven't seen them elsewhere, but they're much nicer to use for this kind of thing compared to the short ones you use for automotive use often. Let's say I take a 5 thou feeler gauge and slide that in there between the tooth and the bar. I can get it in there, but it's kind of tight. So the gap is probably just under 5. I'm going to try a 4 thou feeler gauge. Here it says 0 0.004 inches. And try that one. That's about right. It's a lot easier to move, but not sloppy. There's still some tension there. So I would say the gap between the bar and that tooth is 4 thou here. Now I'm going to move that blade back. Remember, it is unplugged to put the exact same tooth with the pencil mark at the back. And now when I move the same miter gauge forward, it's actually not quite touching. If I try a 5 thou feeler gauge back there now, I can't even get it in. There's no way that there's a 5 thou gap there. If I go down to maybe 2 thou, you have to watch the thin feeler gauges because they're so easy to damage. Now I can get the 2 in a little tight. I would say the gap here is probably about 1.5 thou and at the front it was 4. So that confirms the blade is definitely angled this way by about 2.5 thou. Now the factory would have tried to get it parallel, but I don't care what brand of saw you're looking at. If I look at 10 different saws by the same maker and even the same model, one of them will be angled a couple thou this way, another one a couple thou that way. And it's random. Sometimes it's 8 thou, sometimes 1. Every single saw is different. I just don't think this level of precision is possible at the factory level. And that's why people who buy machinery need to know how to do these things to get really high quality results. So let's try to adjust this table now to increase this to, to a larger number. Now remember that as we rotate that table, not only is that number going to get bigger, but this number is going to change too because we're pivoting on a point way over here in the front left corner of the saw. So as I pivot the table, I need to keep measuring both points on the same tooth. And my goal is for the back to be 3 to 5 thou larger than the front. Now what I've done, I've got a uh, what we call a uh, pipe clamp. This is a pony number 50, my standard clamp for, uh, for edge gluing, as you recall from the first lesson we did. Um, I'm just looking for my rubber mallet. If you take a rubber mallet, the way I used to do this sort of thing, and I still have to with the contractor saw sort of scenario, is to tap the table and kind of guess by looking here that it has moved and then continue doing the measurements. When it's a contra uh, not a contractor saw but a cabinet saw like this, what I've uh, come up with is if I put a clamp where one end of the clamp is touching the table but the other end of the clamp is touching the cabinet on the other side, then just by turning this dial ever so slowly, I can start pulling the table into the alignment I want, which is much nicer than just hitting with a mallet because I have so much control. Okay, now let's see if this makes sense to you. Because I want the gap here to be bigger, and remember I'm moving the table, not the blade. I want to move the table like this. By moving the table like this, this steel bar swivels that way, which means the gap will become bigger. So moving the table that way means I need the clamp pad to be on the back of the table, but on the front of the cabinet itself. Now I'm just resting the pipe of the uh, clamp on top of the door here on this saw. 
but if you didn't have the door here, you might have it on the other side for a left tilt saw. You could put a roller stand there or something to help you hold it or have, you know, two people doing this. I've got this clamp pad on the cabinet, but at the back, I need the clamp pad touching the back of the table. So let's go around the back. This is supposed to be on the table, but I have this rear fence rail here. I can just go on that. They're bolted to each other. It doesn't matter. So this should be sticking up against that. Whereas on the other side, the clamp pad, instead of pointing up, will be pointing sideways to touch the cabinet itself. All right, so I don't want to lose track of the numbers that I'm dealing with here. So remember that the distance between the steel rod and the tooth when positioned at the front of the blade was about 4 thou, 0 .004 inches. At the back, I had about one and a half thou, which is 0 .0015 inches. Okay, that isn't 15 thou, that's one and a half thou. So I'm going to turn the pony clamp now until the back measurement is three to five thou bigger than that, let's say 0 .007 to 0 .009, but then I have to slide the miter gauge back and confirm that this is still four thou, and likely it won't be, it, it will have changed as well. I'll just continue to do that until these two numbers are three to five thou different, with the back of course being the larger one. All right, so you can see here how close the gap is. I'm gonna start turning this pony clamp at the front of the saw. Now there should be some resistance because remember I only loosened three bolts well and the front left corner one last. Now you can see it getting larger already. Do you see the gap there? Just getting ever so large. And now I'm gonna, I, I can tell it's larger, so I'm gonna start measuring. I wanted somewhere between seven and nine thou. So let me start with the seven and see if I can get it in at all. I would call that a slightly snug seven. You see the blade just moving a tiny bit right now. Slightly large, slightly tight seven, but not too bad. If I try a six thou feeler gauge, yeah, that's almost loose, I would say. So it's probably about six and a half to seven thou. So I think I'll Maybe crank that clamp just a bit more and see if the seven goes in a little easier or even the eight. Okay, seven is definitely easier. Let me try the eight now. Let me just see. Yeah, the eight is a little snug. I'm going to increase the gap even more. Try again. That's better. A snug eight. Well, actually not bad. Okay, so now I have, let's say, r roughly eight thou at the, at the back. Now, if I come back to the front and I still have four thou at the front, then I'm done. But if the front has changed to something like uh, six thou, then I wouldn't be done. So, and this is why it's so important to get rid of the slop between the miter gauge bar and the slot before doing this measurement. Otherwise, the two measurements could be different just because the miter gauge has moved laterally. Bring the same tooth that, that I marked with the pencil back to the front and line that tooth up. And let's now take a measurement there. It used to be about four thou. Here's four thou, let me check it. I try to get the tooth right in the middle of the circle of this rod in case there's any variance even on that. Okay, the four is definitely easier, so that number has increased. Try the five thou. That's a little too easy as well. Now seven thou is tight, so it looks like the front may have changed to something like six thou. Yeah, I would call it a six. So if we go back to the board here, just uh, rethink where we are. We now have six thou at the front, and at the back I had eight. So now I'm only two thou apart, so I'm very close, but I want at least three, 
and I don't mind four or five. Um, so I, that means I have to keep cranking. In other words, I did increase um, from from the the front being, um, you know, ang from the blade being angled the wrong way to now being angled the right way, but only by two thou difference, and I want at least three to five. So I'm gonna go back and turn that clamp just a little more. This time I'll start measuring at the front instead of the back since I'm already there. And I can get the seven thou in at the front now before I could only get the six. And it's a little snug. I don't think I'll get the eight in very easily. Now the eight is tight. You can see the blade moving there. Okay, so I now have seven thou at the, at the front and the back is likely to have changed again. You can see why the blade needs to be, or the saw needs to be unplugged when I'm handling the blade this way. By the way, use a good blade for this kind of measurement. A clean blade, a newer blade. It doesn't have to be new, but it has to be in good shape. Not something covered in pitch and all, all dirty. Let me try the nine thou now. Nine thou is not too bad. I wouldn't call it tight. It's just kind of borderline. I don't think the 10 will make it. And a little bit too tight. Back to the board. It looks like I have sort of a, um, let me, well, I have sort of a nine thou at the back and a seven thou at the front. So I, I, I've changed the numbers, but it's still about two thou apart. Okay, that means I'm being a little too conservative in my turning of the clamp. Let me uh, speed things along a little bit. One of the difficult things about the whole thing is that you can get it right and then tighten the bolts that hold the table saw top to the cabinet and then remeasure and find it's moved. So that's why you don't want the bolts to be too loose. It's a very fine measurement. Now, back to the back tooth. I got a 10 in there now. I don't actually have an 11 thou gauge here. I have a 12, but I can combine gauges. There's no point in combining a 10 and a 1, because the 1 is so thin, it'll damage it. Let me show you exactly how thin one thou is. It's something like tin foil, which is why anyone who says they can get this blade parallel to the miter slot by zero thou, I actually don't believe them. I'm going to take a six thou and a five thou combined, which gives me 11, and try that setup. Not bad. It seems like it's about 11. So 11 thou minus 3 would give me 8 back here. Let me see if the same tooth gives me 8 or less. This is an 8 thou right here. That seems pretty good. Nine. Yeah, it's a little bit tighter. See the blade moving there. Okay, I'm gonna turn the clamp one more time and give it one final measurement. I think I'm pretty much there. Okay, that's about an eight thou at the front. As long as I have 11 or a bit more at the back, then I'm doing pretty well. So I'll try, actually I'll try the 12 thou first since I have a feeler gauge that's 12.012 inches. 
try that. See if I can get it in. Now that's awfully tight. Try a six and a five, which is 11. Yeah, I can get that in all right. So it looks like I have just the three thou difference now from front to back. Now what I have to do, get my hex key, tighten those bolts, double check that if it does move at all, at least I still have my three to five thou difference. And then we'll finish up by testing with a cut on the right side again and hoping that that burn and the shutdown run out have both disappeared. So I've tightened up the bolts again. Don't forget it's not just the three bolts that I loosened a fair bit, but also the fourth bolt that I loosened just enough that I could pivot on it. And then I rechecked the measurement on the same marked tooth front and back. And this is what I came up with. Let me just erase the old numbers. I now have 11th out at the back, 0 0.011 inches, and 8th out at the front. So I have my 0 0.003 inch minimum clearance. Remember, I'm happy with anything from 3 to 5 thou. Basically, as you get beyond 5, I find the quality of cut goes down. Anything less than 3 tends to get hit by my shutdown run out. I think if you're having trouble getting the measurement correct, I would err on the side of going just a little bit towards the high side because every saw has a different amount of run out, never mind the blade that you're using. So what we should do next is do our test cut again to see if we've now eliminated that burn and shut down run out that we had. And I'll just move a few tools here for safety. Okay, so you heard the cut on the front teeth. Now I'll go to the rear teeth and see what we hear. Okay, I didn't hear any cutting, so that's good. But let's see about the shutdown run out now. Sounded good. Very nice. I actually see just the faintest little line at the shutdown run out point. I actually can't even feel it, which is showing how small it is. So it looks like the three thou difference I have might have been just a hair better if I went for four or five. This is adequate, but if I were you, when you get home, I think I would aim for four or five, you know, go right to five, and then you won't have to worry about it at all. So now that we have the blade on the table saw angled three to five one thousandths of an inch this way relative to the miter slot, we now want to uh, set our fence to be parallel to the miter slot. You see, if the fence just happened to be angled this way a little bit, then that would undo what we just did on the blade, at least during rip cuts. Of course, we also wanted the blade angled so we can get perfect cross cuts in the right miter slot. But let's get that fence parallel now as well. So what I do is just bring it over so the left side of the fence is in line with, say, the right wall of the miter slot and then lock it down. I'm just doing it by feel but there's a gap between the fence and the slot so it's a little bit hard to tell. I'm going to take a very accurate ruler here and just lay it on its face and slide down. Now that sound you hear, my ruler isn't hitting the bottom of the slot, I'm actually caught on the metal which uh, forms the side wall of the slot. That means that my fence is too far th that way. So I'm just going to loosen it and tap it over this way a little more and lock it again. Now it's just barely too far right now. I'll do it one more time. 
Okay, now you just hear the tiniest scraping. So if my fence is too far right, it's by a tiny amount, maybe half a thou. Over here, I'm definitely hitting. So the fence right now is angled that way relative to the slot. So I need to adjust it now to swing it over that way a little bit. So when I pull the fence up, you'll see that there's a set screw here. There's actually one on each side. And by turning those, that determines the positioning this way when I lock down the handle. It actually pulls this part of the fence against the back of the fence rail. So I need to go um, this way, which means this, this part here has to move this way. Okay, that means I have to turn this one clockwise so it goes in further, this one counterclockwise to back it out. And just a tiny amount. These are very small adjustments. So that's counterclockwise just a little, clockwise just a bit, and then we try it again. Once again, trying to get right up to that wall and locking it. I'm catching, that means I'm too far right. Okay, that's better. Over here, I'm still catching. I can actually feel it with my finger. So that just means I'm being a little too cautious <clears throat> in how I turn these set screws. I'll go a little bit more this time. Back that off a bit. And try again. You may have a different fence system. There are different kinds, so you may have to look at the manual to determine the way that that yours adjusts, but um, a lot of fences are designed like this one here. That sounds close. I'm going to bring it over a bit again. It's amazing how many things in woodworking you can tell by sound instead of sight, because the measurement is so fine you can't actually see it. That's just about right. I hear nothing there on both sides. I'm going to bring it back this way just a touch. Lock again. Okay, that's about right now. Now, if you were to make a mistake on that adjustment, I would rather you made the mistake of setting the fence too far this way than this way. Because being too far this way means that the board is being squeezed in a tapering shape here between blade and fence. Not only are you going to burn the wood, like, like I showed you before when the blade was angled inward, but you also could have the board thrown back at you. I'll go over all the techniques and kickback and uh, why a splitter should be here in the first place a little later, but try to get the fence parallel to the slot, but if there's any error, I would rather you were one thou this way as opposed to one thou closer to the blade at the back. One last thing in terms of fence adjustment, I'd like to make sure that the fence is 90 degrees to the table as well. And when I hold my square here, the square is touching at the bottom. There's just a tiny gap at the top. That means I need the whole fence to go like this. Well, there are some other adjustment bolts on the top of the fence here. Because I need to go this way, I need to turn this one clockwise to shift it upwards and the other one counterclockwise. Again, you have to look at your own manual to figure out how your, your fence adjusts, but this one has some very handy adjustment right there. Now the next thing we have to set up is the actual splitter positioning and the splitter brackets on the saw. So let me start by just explaining what exactly a blade guard is, is for. There are three parts to any blade guard. First of all, we have the actual cover, the plastic 
guards, I've seen metal ones as well, that surround the blade and prevent you from accidentally touching the blade. Those are the kinds of accidents where somebody just isn't thinking clearly one day and with just, just by mistake somehow moves their hand into the blade. So that's what that protects you from. We have another part here. Um, well, let me show you this first. This finger here, called an anti-kickback finger. What it does is if a board is about to be thrown back at you, the finger is supposed to stop the board from being allowed to go backwards. I call that sort of a backup plan. In other words, this is trying to save you from an accident that is already happening. The most important part of the guard is the splitter itself, which is basically just the metal here. And what that metal does is when it's in the saw like this, I'll show you how to adjust this later, but when it's in the saw, the right side of that splitter should be in line with the cut line of the wood because it actually holds the wood against the fence behind the blade. And when I go into technique later, I will tell you how critical it is that the left hand is not allowed to travel past the front of the blade or even the front of the guard while ripping. The left hand doesn't go in this area or this area. What happens when a, a kickback occurs, a piece of wood is coming through here and then somehow the operator allows it to drift off the fence while it goes over the rear teeth, which are going upward. The blade suddenly shoots the board either up in the air like this and it flies over your left shoulder if you're very lucky and standing in the right place, or it just throws it forward at extreme speed and can hit you anywhere in the, in the stomach, in the ribs. There are lots of reported cases of serious injuries. And actually I've spoken to people who have had kickbacks that didn't get hit, but have told me that the board had enough speed to go through drywall. Uh, one person told me it went right through his garage door, through a wooden panel, through uh, even two sets of windows. So it has tremendous velocity and if it hits you, you can have a very serious injury. The whole thing happens because the piece of wood is allowed to go like this and over the rear teeth, which of course can't happen if the right side of the splitter is set in the right place. I really believe if this is set up perfectly that a kickback can't occur, or at least that has always been my experience. I'll just mention this quickly. This is not for this saw, but it's now uh, now saws are starting to come out with a requirement um, of having what we call a riving knife instead of a splitter. One of the complaints with this kind of guard is that you can't leave it on when cutting a dado or a rabbit. In other words, you have to cut all the way through the piece of wood in order for this piece of steel, which is quite tall, to pass through the cut, through the wood. This kind of thing, this is from another Steel City table saw, a different one that has a riving knife system. This goes into the saw, but it's designed that the top of that splitter would be just slightly below the arc of the blade itself, which means even when you're not cutting all the way through, the splitter can fit through the cut. So this can be left on for rabbits and dados. As you raise and lower the blade with the, with the cranking wheel on the front, this actually goes up and down with the blade so that it's always just below the arc of the, of, of the blade. Whereas this, when you raise and lower the blade, this is just stationary, stays in one place. Okay, a little bit later on when I show you how to cut dados and rabbits, I'll show you sort of a splitter system I came up with on my own. It isn't a riving knife, it doesn't go up and down with the blade, but it's still a very nice alternative to this kind of guard when cutting a rabbit and dado. At least I can have some form of splitter in there to increase my safety. Now what I'd like to do, and I have to tell you that I pretty much never do a rip cut, almost never do a rip cut without a guard. 
without a splitter especially, because I, I, I feel it is that dangerous. But for the sake of showing you what a kickback is, I'm going to attempt to actually cause a kickback, just to show you how it works. Of course, I'm using a piece of styrofoam instead of wood, because if it does happen to hit me, I don't want to be laying on the floor. I'm going to push this through and see if I can make it actually kick back, just so you understand how it happens. Let me just uh, go and plug in the saw first. Okay, I'm just going to put on my safety glasses, turn on my air cleaner here. I've set the blade just a little bit higher than the material I'm cutting and let's see what happens. That was actually faster than I would have expected for a large piece like that. This is the only way to experience a kickback um, without risking your life. Let me explain what happened there. First of all, while I was cutting this piece, let me just turn off the air cleaner. While I was cutting this piece, and I'm going to cover technique later, but I purposely pushed forward on this corner, which of course is going to pull it off the fence like that. And it's very common for a beginner, not even a beginner, a lot of people, to feel that their hand shouldn't be over on the left because that's where the blade is, so it's more dangerous. But having your hand on the right pivots you off the fence and, and makes a kickback happen. As that happened, I'm pushing like this over the spinning blade. The rear teeth are trying to throw this up off the table and that way. And if you look underneath at the gash that occurred along the bottom as it spun off the saw, that's what a, ki what a kickback is. But if this were a piece of wood, it would be obviously much harder when it hits the back wall. I've had um, two kickbacks happen to me and both times it was because I was too lazy to put my blade guard on because I was doing let's say cross cutting with my sled and I knew I was just doing a single rip cut and I thought well I'll just be extra careful on this cut. One of the times it was a wider piece of plywood about a quarter inch thick and it flew up and over my left shoulder, very luckily. The other time it was a narrower piece of wood that just happened to have a point on this end <laughs> because I was doing some corner cabinet triangular shelves, so it had a, a, a sharp point on this end, and it hit me right in the belly button. And I did break the skin. I did not have a serious injury, luckily, but I did break the skin. I basically collapsed to the ground as if someone had just punched me really hard. It happens so fast you don't even know what happened. And believe me when I say that you are terrified of that machine for the next week. And every rip cut for the next several weeks that keeps playing back through your mind and you're just waiting for it to happen again. But I can also honestly tell you that I have never once had a kickback with the splitter in. I really believe, if it's set up properly, that it can't happen. So I'm going to show you next how to test for where that splitter should be aligned and then how to do it. Now, I don't know if you remember, but earlier I keep saying that the right side of the splitter has to be aligned with the right side of the cut line. I'm very careful to say cut line, not the right side of the blade. Now let me explain why. If we're looking sort of an overhead view of the table saw, and I'm just going to really exaggerate this for the drawing so you understand it, the blade 
is angled to the left by 3 to 5 thou further at the rear teeth. On the other hand, my fence is actually parallel to the miter slot. Let's say the miter slot happens to be here. Well, I'm pushing the board along the fence, so I'm traveling parallel to it, but the blade's off like that. That means that the kerf, in other words, if I have a board right here, this is a board with a cathedral pattern on it, let's say, going through where that blade is, the right front corner of the blade creates the right side of the kerf or the cut line, but the left rear corner is going to create the left side. So let's say my blade is a full kerf blade at 0.126 inches thick, but my blade is angled over by 5 thou, then my kerf isn't 0.126, it's 0.131 because you have to add the 5 thou that I angled the blade over. Now when you look at a manual for a table saw or, or different articles I've read and books and so on, they usually tell you to put a ruler up against the right side of the blade in order to set the splitter up. Obviously if I put the, a ruler on here, my splitter would be somewhere way over here like this. But my splitter needs to be over here in line with the right side of the cut line. Not only that, but when you put a ruler on a blade between the teeth, that's where you're going to do it because the teeth are in the way, that means there's already going to be a gap between the wood you're cutting and the splitter by the difference between the width of the tooth itself and the blade body which is what we call set, right? There's some set in the teeth so that the right side of the body isn't binding and, and burning the wood. So what I'd like to do is to set the splitter in the right position so that as the board goes through, the right side of the kerf or cut line is actually touching the right side of that metal splitter. The only way to determine that point is to do an actual rip cut. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to test for it and then how to set the splitter up. Okay, so what I'm going to do is do an actual test cut. Now whatever material you choose to do this test with, it's critical that it be a relatively flat object, but also that it has an edge that is incredibly straight to ride on that fence. Okay, this is actually a piece of plywood with a couple of pieces of edge banding on either side but this could have been a solid board that I milled very accurately as well. Okay, but that's nice and straight. And I'm going to bring the fence over. I don't really care what uh, the actual width is, but I want to bring it over here, let's say, so that I'm just cutting off maybe half an inch or an inch, something like that. This board shouldn't be too narrow because I have to do a rip cut right now with no splitter, which is risky. The only way to do it safely is instead of using a push stick, which only pushes forward but can't hold the material to the fence, I'm going to use a push pad to hold it tight to the fence while I do the cut. I'm going to have to put my hand in here, which I don't normally do. I think I'll go a little wider. Now, just to be extra safe, not a bad idea to use a feather board too. This is one of these magnetic mag switch feather boards. And that's incredibly strong right there on the table with a magnet. Of course, I could use a regular feather board that locks in the miter slot as well. But I'm going to go ahead and make that cut now. And normally we would set the blade just a little higher than the material. But we have to think about this. I actually want the blade at full height so that the full 3 to 5 thou uh, difference between front and back teeth is registered during this cut. You see, if the blade's at full height, the front right corner of, of a front right pointing tooth is further right than it would be if I'm down low. Like this. It's probably only a one, one and a half thou difference, but 
it could matter. So I'm going to put it at full height and go ahead and make this cut. Okay, there's my cut. Just get rid of that piece. Now let me explain why this method is important. When you go into the saw, when I go in in a few minutes to try and adjust the bracket down below that holds the front of the splitter, it's very hard to access the bolts with that blade in the saw. It's very hard to get in with the hex key. By cutting something first, what I've done, as long as I don't move that fence, I leave it in the same spot locked down, this right here, this wooden edge, left edge, is the right side of the cut line, which means I don't even need the blade anymore. I can now take the blade off the saw and then put the splitter onto the two brackets and move the splitter against that wood and then tighten the brackets. And I've now set up the splitter with the right side of it tight to the right side of the cut line. And I don't need any blade to do that. So make sure you don't forget when you go home and do this, don't move that fence. Unplug the saw, take the insert out, take the blade off, and then we'll uh, go from there. So I've unplugged the saw. I'm going to take the insert out now and now loosen the blade. Personally, I always change a right tilt saw from behind the saw because first of all, you notice the insert is closer to the back of the saw. So it's a much bigger reach from there. But also I need to turn this nut, which I feel more comfortable doing with my right hand as a right-handed person. So I'm just going to lock that on. We have an arbor here with a little uh, machined section that the wrench fits on so you don't have to jam a piece of wood against the teeth while you do it. And then I'm going to just turn this big nut here. That's a little bit strange because I have to turn the nut clockwise to loosen it. It's actually reverse threaded. If it weren't reverse threaded, then the force of cutting itself would loosen that nut over time. So it's backwards, so just remember counterclockwise to tighten, clockwise to loosen. But if it's a left tilt saw, it would actually be a normal thread because it's on the other side. It works a little differently. Take off the nut. It's easier to fit my hand in like this from the back. And then we have a large washer here that goes on. And then pull the blade off. It's a little bit tight, especially when it's a new saw. It sort of wears the arbor a little bit over time as it gets older. And when you pull it out, try not to bang the teeth on the different cast iron parts underneath or the steel and things like that. I also don't like putting blades down on steel surfaces. I'd put it on wood like that. I would put it on this fence here because it's plastic. We always have to protect those carbide teeth and not bang them around. So now that the blade is completely out of the way, I'm also going to lower the arbor way down as far as I can get because now I can access the brackets or the bracket here that holds the splitter and of course this one's easy to access outside. Now if we look underneath, first of all, this bolt right here is what holds the front bracket or the front part of the splitter to the saw. 
Again, every saw may have a slightly different uh, mechanism for holding a splitter, but this is quite common. And this is going to go down in behind the washer there after the, the bracket is set up. Well, actually even to set it up. Then at the back, we have this other bracket and this is going to be bolted through this hole with a bolt and a lock washer, a nut and a flat washer, a couple of flat washers, one on either side. Okay, so it depends on the kind of saw that you have at home. Now one thing I wanted to talk about this, it's very common for someone to take a blade guard off to do uh, something like a cross cut with a cross cut sled where you can't have it, can't use it. And to just take the splitter out but leave the, uh, the bolt dangling there like that. I always tell people either remove it completely or tighten it fully when not in use because the vibration of the saw itself could make the bolt loosen up over time. If it happens to suddenly fall out and land on a spinning blade, it's going to be fired out at you like a bullet. Now let's take a look down inside. We have two, um, two bolts here, this one and this one. If I loosen both of them, it allows the bracket to move laterally like this, as well as pivot. So I have two goals here. One is get the lateral placement of the splitter to touch the board I just cut right up against the cut line. Number two, after this is in, I would also like the splitter to be 90 degrees to the table, which you can check with a square like this. So basically, you loosen these two bolts, and depending on where you place the bracket when they're tightened, that determines whether this is vertical or not, as well as the lateral placement. Now on the back, we have another bracket here. And if I loosen these two set screws, that allows this bracket to slide back and forth so that I can get it the proper distance for the uh, slot to line up with the splitter rear, rear section. Also, depending on what angle I have it at when I tighten it, that determines whether the splitter is vertical or not. Then, these two bolts hold this angle bracket to the cast iron bracket underneath it. So by moving that back and forth, I can also adjust laterally for that splitter. So I have to loosen a number of different bolts here, then get the splitter on, at least onto the brackets, and then start trying to adjust everything so that the splitter is against the wood and 90 degrees at the same time. Sometimes you almost need a helper to get that right because there's too many things to do and not enough hands. I've got the splitter now bolted down to the front bracket and both and the, and the rear bracket, completely bolted down tight, but the brackets themselves are completely free moving now. You can see how I can move the splitter left and right, you know, laterally like that, but I could also angle because this thing turns and the bracket inside the saw also pivots. So the key now. I've got to get this anti-kickback finger on top of the wood so it's out of the way. The key now is to hold this tight against the wood while tightening the bolts under the saw and then also checking for square because you may have to pivot. You may have to move out laterally and then pivot inward to get that angle correct as well. Okay, it's not critical that this be exactly 90 degrees. These things are often not perfectly flat anyway. <clears throat> but certainly, while I'm cutting, it is critical to me that there be no gap at all between the splitter and the wood, especially right here. You see, this is the first point of contact with the splitter after you're cut. So I want to get to the safety zone very soon. If the back happens to have a slight gap. I actually don't care very much. I, I really need the safety up here. Over here, having the tiniest gap would actually make it pass through easier, so not a big deal. Try to get it on there, but don't worry as much about here.
obviously a riving knife is only here. It doesn't even exist back there. So this is what's important. Now after you tighten down everything, what you might find is when you do a test cut at the end that it's very hard to go through. In other words, you've pushed this so tight against the wood that the friction is very high. Try first putting a little bit of paste furniture wax against the right side of the splitter. And if that's enough, then just use it like that. After a lot of use, the, the metal will wear slightly and it'll get easier to push through. But if it's really tight, that's not safe either, having to push a board through that, that hard. Then you might want to loosen the bolts uh, the, for the brackets. Try one more time, maybe possibly even sliding something between the two, like, like a one or two thou feeler gauge. So you're actually, it sounds like you're actually creating a two thou gap, but it might be just what you need to make it touch, but without too much friction. Okay, so just tighten everything down, and only after everything's tight can we determine whether it was done correctly. This is the kind of thing, again, if you have a helper around, they can sort of hold this for you while you're tightening the bolts, and it makes it a lot easier. I've tightened down all the brackets, all the different bolts and uh, set, uh, set screws and so on. I've now brought the same board back. Remember, the fence has never moved yet. The beauty of having the fence not move is that I'm able to test using that board and I don't have that blade in the way. It's very hard to get at those two bolts for the bracket with the blade there. So now I, I bring this in to see if it gets through okay. Now it doesn't take that much force to push through, so I like it. But what I want to know is, is it actually touching the metal because it's supposed to be. Clearly it's not touching the metal back here, but I actually don't care that much about that. In fact, by having this angled slightly that way, it's helping, it's helping to hold the offcut on the other side open. So that's not even a bad idea. But it's critical that the metal right here, you can see just the one spot, is definitely touching the wood. In other words, if you put your hand on this board or a push pad, you should not be able to move to the left and then see a gap develop between the fence and the board. It should be wedged between, but not so tight that you can't move fairly easily. Okay, so that's the proper setup. The reason this is called a splitter is that it splits the workpiece and the offcut apart because sometimes when you're ripping a wide, say, solid wood board, the two parts could actually bend inward and pinch the rear teeth of the blade. You'd rather that it pinch this, but can't actually grab the blade or it could kick it back at you. Okay, but to me, the main function of a splitter has nothing to do with ho holding the two halves apart. It has to do with holding the wood tight to the fence at the back teeth. Particularly, I'll, I'll cover this later, because my left hand is not allowed to travel in that danger zone. Now that that is all set up, the next step, the last step really, is to go ahead and plug the saw in and move the fence over to do a new rip cut. And what I want to do is not only test the splitter, I need to calibrate the fence tape. We've never done that yet. All I've done is made the fence parallel to the miter slot and 90 degrees to the table. But what I can do is, let's say, set the fence in a place such that I get, say, a, a five inch wide cut, exactly five inches, if I can. And then, after that cut is done, grab a tape measure and measure the cut. And let's say that the cut, let's say I was aiming for five, but it's actually four and uh, 31, 30 seconds, let's say. Well then, you look at the tape cursor on the fence and it has to read what the cut actually is, 4 and 31, 30 seconds. Table saws always have some kind of adjustment on the cursor itself so that you can move it over to read the correct number. Okay, so just loosen whatever bolts are there, slide it over to read what the actual cut was and tighten it down and that's called calibrating your fence. Once it's calibrated, it should be fairly accurate 
Um, you might find on some table saws, I've seen this, where it's actually accurate for a certain distance and the further out the fence goes, you start losing some accuracy. The reason is that the tape is sort of a plastic tape that's um, stuck down to the fence rail with an adhesive. I get the feeling in the factory when it's being applied, it might actually be stretched a bit as it's laid down. So the fence can be very accurate up to say 12 or 16 inches and once you get out to two feet you notice it's just off by a tiny bit like a 64th of an inch once you get out to 48 inches on a big fence it could be out a lot more 30 second or even a bit more so for very important cuts when the fence is way out I always double check with a tape measure measuring from fence to blade front tooth to be sure before I commit to the cut